of the areas that I find intriguing as a non-scientist is a field called quantum mechanics. It seems rather unusual to me, sometimes even strange. So we've asked Dr. Erica Carlson to join us to talk about this uh, interesting area. Erica, welcome. Take a few minutes, if you would, and kind of explain to us what is quantum mechanics? Well, quantum mechanics is uh, the physics that we use to describe what happens to very small objects. So think very, very small things on the scale of an atom or smaller or perhaps a few atoms. And objects that are that small display quantum effects. Now, some of the strange quantum effects that we see uh, are that when we, when we view things on those link scales, they, they don't appear to be little tiny balls, right? So maybe when you learned about atoms, you may have heard that atoms are comprised of several particles. They'll have a nucleus, which is, uh, has protons and neutrons in it, and then there are electrons swarming around the nucleus. Uh, what we've learned in quantum mechanics is that we also need to include the wave nature of those particles. So for example, what kind of, um, exactly how is it that those electrons swarm around the nucleus? We find that we get a much better, much far more accurate description of nature when we say that those electrons actually are, are waves and are taking on hmm. wave patterns around uh, the nucleus. So you're familiar um, in your everyday life with what we call standing waves. Standing waves are waves that have repeated motion. So if you've ever jumped rope or seen somebody jump hmm. rope, right. that jump rope is going in what's called a standing wave. The wave shape itself just repeats in time. It's not moving past you or something like that. So, so that's a great place to start in thinking about waves. You can think about waves with one other dimension that was a wave on a on a, a string which only has one dimension let yourself think about waves in a two-dimensional space so maybe you've seen water waves on a pond right. those have a little bit of a different character if i drop a rock in the center of a pond that's quiescent those waves radiate out in circles so those circles are the natural shape that a wave in two dimensions takes around a central disturbance. So now let's blow our minds and extend that to three dimensions because that's what electrons have to do. Electrons have a three dimensional space to move in, but they have this one disturbance at the middle, which is the nucleus of the atom that they are attracted to. So the electrons actually take three dimensional standing waves around this nucleus. So if you've had a chemistry class, if you remember your high school chemistry, right. probably they taught you about S orbitals and P orbitals, did they teach you that? I think so. Okay, do you remember any of the shapes of them? Like the S orbital versus the P orbital? The, the S orbital is like a ball. Okay. Okay, and maybe when they drew a P orbital for you, maybe they drew a little figure eight, which represented a dumbbell. Uh, and then there are many more complicated ones as well. These are standing waves in three dimensions. So the electron comes in, think of it as a wave, and it's making a wave centered on this one singular disturbance in the same way that if I drop a rock into a pond, I see those circular waves. Right. Those are the right. standing waves in two dimensions. In three dimensions, the first standing wave is spherical. That's why the S wave is spherically shaped. The next one is uh, the P wave, and in the P wave it's, it's kind of doing a, something a little bit more, more like this, it, um, and there's a little, little node in the middle. In the same way that if you take a jump rope, so think of a jump rope, and you're used to seeing a jump rope like this, if you had a long enough jump rope you could have two humps in that jump rope okay. and put a node in the middle. P wave is where the electron has a three-dimensional wave with a big node in the middle, just like that jump rope having two humps on it. So quantum mechanics proceeds that way. We have to think in terms of the wave nature of objects. Now is the seemingly mysterious element in all of this, is it because we're dealing with such small things that measurement is is difficult? Is that part of the mystery? Well, that's absolutely part of it, is that the things are small. Uh, another huge part of the mystery is that um, some of the phenomena, most of the quantum mechanical phenomena, don't become evident until you can measure on very tiny link scales. What that means is that this is a subject in physics where you don't get to apply your everyday physical intuition. That's okay, why I make analogies right. like jump rope or yeah drop a rock in a pond, you have experience with those waves. You don't really have everyday experience typically with what three-dimensional standing waves look like. They're a little hard to, to describe. So because our everyday physical experience 
doesn't involve obvious quantum effects. There are some, right? I mean, you, we do have some quantum effects uh, in, our, in our everyday life, but, but for the most part, you, you can't take your intuition about how a ball operates and apply that down to the way atoms behave. That's a big part of it. Another part of it is that these objects are fuzzy. They're not okay. solid. You know, when I interact with objects in my everyday life, I perceive them as solid. If you could imagine doing like a camera zoom in onto tiny, tiny link scales, you'd find that these things are not solid at all. An atom is 99.99, .99, I forget how many nines, percent empty space. So then why the heck does the thing feel solid, right? So um, there's a great analogy for this, which is uh, you're probably familiar with a fan, right? You have any sure. fans in your house Absolutely. or like a, a cooling fan? So when the fan is not turned on, you can see that there are distinct blades, usually four or five. Right. And when the fan is not turned on, and only when the fan is not turned on, you could stick your finger in between the blades and you wouldn't get hurt. Once the fan is turned on though, please don't do that. Don't try that at home because when the blades are whirling fast enough, the whole thing may as well be a solid object. Mm. You can't stick your finger in between and not get hurt, which is why I'm making it extremely clear, I hope, do not try this at home. Electrons around an atom are the same way. They're tiny. But they're moving around so fast, they're, they're whipping around so fast in these beautiful standing wave patterns that they feel solid to us. Hmm. Now, when we think about the Christian worldview, we think about some of the challenges between faith and science. Where do you see the quantum mechanics issue as being most relevant? Well, I don't think you'll have issues, say, resolving the Bible with quantum mechanics, sure. mainly because the Bible far as we could tell, it doesn't describe any quantum phenomena. It's, it, you just don't expect to open up the scriptures and learn about uh, quantum field theory. You expect to, to have to discover that one on your own using the methods right. and using the authority that God gave Adam and Eve to do those things. So uh, the places I see it coming up are really from uh, other religions or um, from new age kind of concepts. So uh, if you Google quantum mechanics, you will find all these ads now popping up for you uh, about what you can do with quantum mechanics and what it can do for you. That, uh, you know, it'll say things like, uh, you can use quantum mechanics to create your own reality or to control things. And um, in, in every case, they're, they're abusing quantum ideas. They'll take a phrase that has a specific, highly technical meaning within the field, take it out of the field, use it in its colloquial sense, and then take it in a totally different direction to say that we can actually control things. Honestly, in quantum mechanics, we have way less control over quantum events than we do over um, objects in our, in our everyday life that are at the macroscopic level. So you lose control, you can't create your own reality, I'm sorry. Um, all these interesting things that quantum particles get to do on their tiny link scales typically are not available to us on our macroscopic link scales. You know, quantum particles can tunnel through walls, right? Now they tunnel through with a certain probability. So if we were in, uh, you know, quantum land and we had a quantum baseball, we could throw it against uh, the wall and maybe every fifth time it would just go through, right? You don't ever see a human do that. You know, we never say, oh, I want to get to the next room. It's um, too far to go around through the actual hallways. I'm just going to bang into this wall five times and maybe on the fifth time I'll get through. We just, you know, we don't operate that way. Um, so I think it's important to, to realize the applicability of quantum mechanics. It really is for tiny link scales. Now we see some effects on the macroscopic scale, absolutely, but uh, not only you know, do we do we have less control than we had over over classical physics? Um, they're happening on tiny link scales. It's not the sort of thing where you can quantum wish a red sports car into your um, into your driveway. Otherwise, people would actually do that, right? <laughs>